for taping here. This meeting and, is being recorded. And we're going to continue here. Just give us a sec here while we, we are now going live on Facebook. Okay. Hallelujah. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Amen. Matic Nichols, good to see you, my friend. Amen. Good to see all of you. Hi, everybody. Good night, good night. Good day, yes. good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> yes, it's all well. All right, let me. All right, excellent, excellent. Praise God, praise God. Well, uh, the thing about computers is you have to manage all these windows. <laughs> Make sure all of them stay connected and synchronized. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is indeed a delight. It's a delight to be here. I was just chatting with Dustin earlier, and we know there are people who have been with us since the month of January. You've been with us through these teachings on redemption. Uh, you've been with us through these different months. You've stayed with us. Uh, you have been faithful uh, during this time. And then you've been with us through these weeks of the understanding of the Bible. Uh, Bishop Jamie Inglehart has done a tremendous job. I have heard things I have not heard before. And uh, all of us have heard things we have not heard before. And most of us have had things that we've had to consider and reconsider again. Go back and study again, which is a good thing. Amen. And uh, when your view of God changes, your whole worldview changes. Your, your view of the world comes out of your view of God. And this is fundamental, my friend. Uh, this is fundamental. If you believe that God is an angry God, then you will act in a similar way. If you believe he's a God of love and reconciliation, you will also act accordingly. And so we've had, you know, the, the, the man was created to be um, like, like a, an engine, creating worlds. Matting and I were part of a Zoom call yesterday, I think it was Matting. We were talking about how man is created to reproduce stuff. And he reproduces worlds after the image of God that he has in him. So if he's got a fallen image of God, then he will reproduce worlds. Cain reproduced, he went out and he created a society. And that's what's happening. We have been, we're seeing men who are creating different kinds of societies, whether they're, they're, they're democratic societies or socialist societies, you know, or even church societies. I believe that even our, the church that we've created, the version of church, comes out of an image of God as, the, as, as we see it, as we see it. And so we've created, out of these images in our mind, we've created culture, we've created behavior, and we've affected destinies. And so what's happening today is that God is correcting that image in us. He's, he's, he's given us a clear picture of what he is. You know, uh, this coming Sunday is, is Father's Day. And the scripture that God has put in my heart is, show us the Father. Show us the Father. Because we've got a warped view of Father. We've got a wrong view of Father. And we've created worlds out of that wrong view of Father. Amen. And so, ladies and gentlemen, God is adjusting us. He's correcting us. He is refreshing us. He is truly reviving us. This, for me, is a true revival. When, you are, when your whole world gets shifted back in the right direction. So we want to welcome all of you on the call, amen, and uh, that are on right now, and those that are tuning in from different nations, some from the United States, some from, uh, from Canada, some from England, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and, and the Caribbean. Welcome, welcome to this, this portal. Welcome to this community where we desire to hear the voice of God. And so, Father, we give you thanks, and we thank you that in you we live and move and have our being. We thank you that you are for us and in us and with us. We thank you that greater is he that's in us than he that is in this world. And we pray tonight that the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of Christ will be manifested among us. We pray eyes to open, ears to unstop, hearts to be quickened. We would hear your voice. We would become your word and be your will in the earth 
So let thy kingdom come, let thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And Father, we give you praise. We give you praise. And tonight we say that the sick be healed, the devils be cast out, that spirits of ignorance and fear and religion, oh God, be, be, be free from it. Let us be free from every inimical force of darkness. Let our hearts be free. Open our eyes. Let there be light. Let there be light in our lives. Let there be light in our homes. Let there be light in our families. Let there be light in our nations. Whoa. And we declare that we are blessed and not cursed and redeemed from the curse of the law. We say, oh God, we will live and not die and do the will of God in our generation. We bless those who are here. We bless the homes that they represent. We bless the families they represent. We bless even the children that are on the call. I release great life and light to you. Let there be light. Let there be light. Let there be supernatural invasion of our minds and our consciousness right now. We thank you, God, in the name of Jesus. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. I'm just going to share my screen a little bit. Uh, uh, something that's not strange to us. So I'm going to just talk just a frack a little bit about uh, our presenter tonight, uh, Bishop Jamie Inglehart. Okay, we have been uh, privileged and blessed to have him share with us over the past couple of weeks. And um, we've heard things. We've heard things we have not heard before. We've seen things in the spirit we haven't seen before. And uh, we have been, our, our whole lives have been upgraded. And Bishop, I know this is the last night, but it is not the last time we will have you. And uh, we want to thank you personally for being with us and sharing your heart with us. Uh, Bishop Jamie Inglehart is the president and founder of Connect International Ministries, a family of churches, ministries, businesses, and leaders, as well as an author. He serves as a bishop overseer to those in CIM, as well as to many other leaders across the body of Christ. He is widely sought after for his unique multidimensional understanding of the kingdom of God, the new covenant, and the heart of the Father revealed through Jesus Christ. Jamie is married to Wendy, a recording artist for over 29 years. They have ministered across the globe, serving as elders, church planters, Bible school teachers, spiritual parents, and itinerant ministers. Amen. And so tonight we want to welcome all of you, all of you that are on Facebook, who are following us live on Facebook. Welcome, welcome. Uh, just to mention, uh, Bishop uh, Jamie has put in the in the chat his his web address. Please check out the web address. He also offers uh, e courses um, on very important subjects. You're just discussing things like hell, etc., and other areas. Uh, even this particular course on understanding the Bible, I understand, will be made into an e course. And so I want to encourage you uh, to. Take advantage of this. Take advantage. And uh, he has said, and perhaps I can say it, Bishop, that uh, if you go to register for the course and you and you put the word partner, you, you will get a, a huge discount. Amen? So I'm going to present uh, Bishop Jamie to you tonight. I'm just going to give him the floor. And please uh, do all that you have to do. Pour your heart out and just release the word of the Lord to us tonight. Welcome, Bishop. Uh, thank you again, Apostle Kelvin. Uh, it has been, uh, I've enjoyed myself these last few weeks, and uh, it has been uh, great just releasing this. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to teach and talk about. And I want to uh, give me the first couple minutes. I know I haven't done much of this uh, over the last several weeks, but uh, for those of you that would like to follow me, uh, I do mainly, mainly stuff, probably more on Facebook than about anything else. Some stuff on Instagram. Uh, you can send me a friend request. I probably won't be able to add you because it stays full all the time, but you can follow me or you can look up my name and go to my public figure page. I put pretty much the same content on both of those. Uh, you can follow me there. You can ask me questions there. Uh, I also on Facebook, I have a closed partner page for friends and partners and on that page I discuss stuff that I don't discuss normally in public 
uh, it's really a page for people that are kind of on this journey of, uh, you know, I don't like to call it deconstruction. I like to call it reconstruction, uh, you know, where God is kind of, we're all on this journey of trying to really see correctly and understand God correctly. And so it's a real safe place for dialogue. And I do a couple of Facebook lives a month on there, uh, as well as articles that I, a lot of times I don't share in public. And so if you're interested in that, you can just send me an inbox on Facebook and just tell me that you'd like to be added to the partner page. And uh, there's some great stuff. There's already almost three years of content in there that you could go back and listen to all kinds of videos and there's some rich stuff. Also, when you go to my website, uh, you go to the store, I have my audio book uh, there. It's my, my book with my voice. It's the whole book on audio with commentary. And I think right now it's only like $8.99 or $9.99. It's actually discounted right now on my website. And then it's almost like getting two books because I not only read each myth, but I also give commentary to it. And there's also an ebook on there that was like a, pre, uh, a pre-launch a ebook. So uh, it doesn't look as nice as Kindle, but it's only $3.99. But you can also get it on Kindle and Amazon. And then on the homepage of my website, uh, it'll say uh, Awaken Academy, sign up for e-courses. And you can go click on there right now. Uh, I just put up last night my e-course on the eschatology in the last days. I have one called What the Hell, uh, where we deal with the, the, the elephant in the room, the subject of hell. And then one called A More Complete Gospel, uh, where we hit on all seven things in the New Testament called the gospel, the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Paul, the gospel of the dear son, uh, the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace, and the gospel of the kingdom. All of them are one gospel, but the, it's seven dimensional, and it's so much bigger than just uh, get out of hell and get into heaven. And so all of those courses would be a great blessing to you. Uh, so please go check those out. Or, you know, if our ministry has been a blessing to you over these last several weeks, I know uh, Apostle Calvin has encouraged you to sow there. You can also go and you can give directly on my website if you wanted to be a blessing. Uh, we appreciate uh, anything done. So, all right, done with the commercial. Now let, let, let's get into the close of uh, here, how to understand really the Bible, study it properly. Uh, we ended off last week with uh, metaphors and showing, uh, you know, we talked about hyperbole. We talked about how many metaphors are in scripture. And I, I touched on, I think, only like five or six of them, but there's so many that are full of wonderful typology. And my desire is in this session, section, as well as a lot yesterday, is that it'll give you a desire to get back in the scriptures to see stuff that maybe you haven't seen before and realize there's meaning behind the meanings, you know. Uh, as our friend Dr. Lynn Heil says all the time, truth is like an onion. The more you peel it, the more layers you find. It's multidimensional and it's wonderful. So uh, tonight we're going to kick in and start with similes, with similes. La last week we dealt with metaphors and hyperbole. Simile, it is a figurative language descriptive of one object in its likeness to another using the words like or as. Isaiah 53, 7 says Christ was led as a lamb to the slaughter. First uh, Peter 5 verse 8, it says Satan goes about as a roaring lion. Now we know he's not really a roaring lion because according to uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, that Jesus destroyed him with the power of death that is the devil. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of even stuff uh, he's doing anymore because he's a defeated devil, but he goes about as a roaring lion. Second uh, Peter 3 verse 8, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and thousand years is as a day. That's a simile. It doesn't mean it's exactly like that, but in God's mind, uh, one of his days is similar to a thousand of our days. Romans 4, 17 says, God who calls things that be not as though they were. Matthew 10, 16, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 23, 27, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like, similarly, whitewashed tombs. He wasn't saying they were exactly whitewashed tombs, but he's saying if you look at the properties of a whitewashed tomb, that will show a lot of what you are like, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead man's bones. Numbers 13, 33, when the 12 spies came back, 10 of them said, that we saw the giants in the land and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we also were in their sight. 
uh, you know, I think it's interesting, and I, I don't think I mentioned it in one of these classes, but when uh, what kept the children of Israel out of the promised land is they saw themselves like grasshoppers. Now, what's interesting is when you study the property of a grasshopper, grasshoppers have no ears. Uh, I, I don't know if you realize that or not, but I don't think I've ever taken a magnifying glass and looked at a grasshopper, but they have, they have no ears and they have five eyes, which of course a grasshopper mentality is you're struggling with faith because faith comes by hearing and you have five eyes which we walk by faith or hearing and not by sight or by seeing. And when you have five eyes, all you're focusing on is everything around you and you not set your, your eye or your face like a flint or, or stayed focused. Uh, uh, grasshoppers are constantly also hopping, hopping around. So they had this idea that we are as grasshoppers in our own eyes and in their eyes. So what kept them out of the promised land was a grasshopper mentality. I think it's interesting that you, you go forward 1800 years into the future and the promised land himself had showed up on the earth because Jesus is our promised land. He is uh, the life that we want to live in and desire to be. And before anybody understood that, God sends John and John is translated grace or graciousness and grace shows up eating grasshoppers. I don't think that's an accident at all because what kept them out of understanding the, the joys of the land flowing with milk and honey, which was Christ, uh, is now the very thing that grace came eating up. And by the way, washing it down with wild honey. And what is honey? According to Proverbs, there's honey in the rock. It's the sweetness of the revelation of who we are and what we have in Christ. And he says, that'll remove from you every grasshopper men and locust mentality so that you can fully enter into what Christ has for you. Anyway, that was a little side note. Just felt that sneak up on me just for a minute there. Uh, and so, uh, God calls you as well, though you feel sick. He calls you rich, even though you may feel poor. He calls things which be not as though they were. It says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And it's amazing how a lot of parents love to quote that verse to their kids when they're being rebellious, but they rarely quote the comma, the rest of the verse, because the rest of the verse says, and stubbornness is as idolatry. And a lot of the reasons a lot of times the kids are being rebellious is because the parents are being stubborn. Uh, and so, you know, stubbornness is adultery just as, as uh, a rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Uh, so let's look at just a few of these similes and get some light out of them. Uh, one huge simile is trees. Psalm 1 verse 3 says the righteous are like a tree planted by the rivers of water. They're not trees, but they're like trees. According to Psalms 2, fruit trees and palm trees. Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see Jesus. And not any tree, but a sycamore tree, which is an inferior fig tree. Adam covered himself with figs because he had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All have fallen short of the glory of God. The trees of the field will clap their hand. Jesus prays for a blind man one day. And he said, what do you see? He said, I see men walking as trees. Well, trees don't walk around. Trees are rooted and grounded and planted. And the Pharisees who were constantly around Jesus were not rooted and grounded in love. And so Jesus gave him spiritual sight before natural life, natural sight. The tree of life is a picture of the cross. And Jesus, who is the tree, uh, we see there were two angels guarding the way to the tree of life. And the same two angels, perhaps, were the same two angels that when that when uh, Mary ran in, she saw two angels, one at the head and one at the foot. And perhaps they were the same two angels guarding the way to the tree of life uh, that, that was now we know Christ. Matthew 7, 17, speaking of false prophets, Jesus says, you will know a tree by its fruit. Psalm 96, 12, then the trees of the wood shall rejoice before the Lord. Obviously, it's not that trees are actually rejoicing, but He's giving a simile, saying we are like these trees. In the wilderness, at the waters of Mara, uh, the waters that were bitter, God said, cut down a tree, and it will make the bitter water sweet. That, of course, is a beautiful picture of Christ, who is the tree of life. And he is the cut down tree, that when we receive that tree and we eat of his goodness, and, and he is a life source, uh, he removes the bitterness from our lives. Uh, another simile uh, that is interesting is frogs. Revelation 16, 13, uh, it says that three demon spirits like frogs would be released. So 
in other words, to understand the demonic, you study the properties of a frog. It's not that demons are frogs. It's not that you can't eat frog legs. I personally love frog legs. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we have a Chinese restaurant by our house. I go at least once or twice a month because I got all the frog legs you can eat. I know for some people it's gross. My wife won't eat them. I happen to love them. Uh, they just taste like chicken. Hallelujah. Uh, but anyway, there's nothing wrong with actually having uh, anything with frogs. Frogs themselves are not demons. But he's saying these demonic spirits are a simile. They're like frogs so if you want to understand the demonic study the properties of a frog frogs have no neck they can't turn they can't repent they're stiff necked if you want to know if someone has some type of demonic uh, thing grabbed a hold of them they won't ever repent they won't ever say they're sorry they won't change they're stiff necked so uh, frogs also love to sing in your night season so when you're going through a difficult time rather than weep with you they're normally singing in the midst of it almost glad you're going through it uh, not only that, but frogs live in the mud. What is mud? It's a mixture of water and dirt or a picture of carnality. They're always playing in the mud. Not only that, but frogs constantly are jumping from lily pad to lily pad, church to church, relationship to relationship, job to job. They're never planted anywhere. Not only that, but uh, they love to eat flies, which we know that in the New Testament uh, that Jesus was accused of being Beelzebub which is Lord of the flies. You can always tell there that that is demonic in nature. Not only that, but one interesting thing about frogs is that when you try to grab a frog with your hand, which is a picture of the fivefold ministry, uh, trying to perhaps help someone learn how to submit to the purpose of God, the first thing a frog does is it immediately urinates on the hand and slides and jumps away out of its own urine. Uh, and all of us have experienced that at one time or another, uh, someone who urinated on us and, and ran from us when God was trying to do a work uh, in their lives. So uh, these wonderful similes are all over scripture. And every time you see like or as, there's a truth there that's going to have some wonderful revelation to it. If you'll just grab hold of it, check it out and, and see what that looks like. Uh, the next one is allegory. Allegory is a story which represents a fact or illustrates a thing in parabolic language. A great example is 2 Samuel 12. Nathan was sent to King David, and he tells him a story of a rich man and a poor man, and the rich man took the poor man's lamb. And David gets mad, and Nathan says to him, he said, what, what should be done? He said, well, this man needs to be reprimanded. He needs to be whipped. He needs to be dealt with. And Nathan says, this is you when it's dealing with Uriah's wife. And so he gives him this allegory, tells him a story that illustrates something else in parabolic language. Paul in Galatians 4, 21 to 31, Paul actually uses the word allegory. He says, I speak to you in allegory. And he's talking about two covenants. He's talking about the old covenant and the new covenant. And the allegory is about law, which was given on Sinai, which he calls Hagar, and Ishmael, and then the, which he calls the natural Jews. And then there is the covenant that was given uh, through Abraham, uh, through Sarah to Isaac and on Mount Zion. And he likens Isaac and the new covenant to the church. In other words, he's making a clear distinction when he's saying, just because you are a natural by physical DNA Jew does not mean this is automatically for you. He said, this, this is something, this has always been about the church. Uh, I've been accused for years, uh, people call it replacement theology. And I always tell them there's nothing to replace because there was no covenant ever given to just natural Israel. The covenant on Sinai was given to those who would apply it by faith. And on uh, at Sinai, there wasn't just Israelites there. There was also Egyptians there. There were Africans there. All kinds of different nations came out of Egypt along with the Jews, and God was giving a covenant, a shupa, uh, which is a marriage contract to those who would do their part and apply it by faith. So the covenant of God was always by faith and not by physical DNA. That's why people say, we well, are trying to replace Israel with the church. I said, there is, there's nothing to replace. It's always been about the church. And how we know that is because when you go to Hebrews, Hebrews actually tells us that he calls them the congregation in the wilderness. Now, I was taught my whole life uh, in Bible school and growing up in church that the church didn't start until the book of Acts. But actually, the writer of Hebrews 
calls the wilderness wanderings, he calls them the congregation or the ecclesia, the church in the wilderness. And so the church, this has always been about the church and the body of Christ. It's always been about by faith, because when the nation of Israel did not do their part, and by faith keep their part of the covenant, they would end up in slavery, they would end up in bondage, and they were not walking in the blessings of what God promised. And so there's literally nothing to replace, all right? That's why Paul gives this allegory, and I think he makes it probably clearer than almost anyone else could have, and that allegory shows the difference between the two covenants. I, 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 realized, I realized something about five years ago, and I, I haven't fully preached it yet. I've been working on kind of putting a whole series of messages together on it. But if you really study Genesis to Revelation, it's about two trees. It's about two sons, uh, two men. It's about two covenants. It's about two mountains. Uh, I mean, near, nearly all of it uh, can be summed up between all of those things. Uh, because so much of what you read in between is all about uh, um, Adam and Christ. It's all about those those two sons. It's all about the two mountains. It's all about the two covenants. Uh, it, it just picture after picture after picture of all of that. Now, the next one is parables. Parables are a truth illustrated by a fact. Mark 4 uh, it gives the parable of the sower. Jesus said to you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to the rest, it is given in parables. So Jesus mainly taught in parable language. Uh, Jesus uh, made some wonderful uh, uh, things that uh, the average person could understand. He spent all kinds of time talking about seed and talking about farming and, and talking about parties and, and talking about the kingdom of God's like a man who threw a great, a great feast, a great party. Jesus spent so much of his time giving pictures and being a great storyteller. And, and that's why all of this, even what I just said a few minutes ago, listen, uh, God loves Israel as much as he does every other nation. Uh, just there is no single DNA that has any more blessing on it than anyone else. Uh, that Jesus went to the cross as the last Adam and then rose as this this new race, this new Adam. And now all of us were born into that, resurrected from it. And now all, all we do is believe it and enjoy the blessings of it, which is an absolute uh, beautiful thing. Jesus gives a parable of not hiding your light under a bushel basket. Of course, the Good Samaritan is an amazing picture. I, I think it's interesting that most of Jesus's parables, when you go back and study them, he's predominantly speaking to Jews under the law. And most of his parables are trying to show them that this covenant that he's bringing in the heart of Heavenly Father is to now include all the people that they've excluded. Uh, you know, the story of the Good Samaritan, the, the priest comes by and walks by the man, the rabbi walks by the man, but then it's the one that was the other, the, uh, the you know, the one that was estranged. It was the Samaritan that wasn't a part of the covenant that God says, this is the blessing that's going to be on him. Another great example, and if you actually go to my uh, go to my website and 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 watch my e-course on hell, one of the things I talk about is the parable of, of Lazarus and the rich man. And for years, people have taught that as compartments of hell. But actually, that story has nothing to do with hell. It has everything to do with Jesus showing them that the people that they'd excluded, the Gentiles, were now being included. This is the one thing that always bothered me about the story of Lazarus and a rich man, is after Jesus tells the story, all the Jews there wanted to lay hands on him and stone him. And if you remember the passage, it says he walks through the crowd. And it always bugged me, well, why would they want to stone Jesus if he's just talking about compartments of the afterlife? Because to a Jew at that time, first century Second Temple Jews, they believed in soul sleep. They believed that when you died, uh, you went and slept with your fathers in Sheol or in Hades in the grave. And then when the Messiah would come, he would break through the gates of hell. Literally, when Jesus is standing at Caesarea Philippi and he said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, he was literally standing at the gate of Sheol or the gates of Hades. They're still there today uh, when you go over there because they believed that their Messiah would bust through that gate, go down into the grave. And if you were a Pharisee, you would be resurrected. If you were a Sadducee, you just stayed there because, of course, you were Sadducee. And so, you know, because they didn't believe in any resurrection. So their idea of the afterlife wasn't punishment. It wasn't burning. It was literally soul sleep. 
And the reason this story irritated him so much is Jesus is actually telling a very well-known Egyptian as well as Akkadian and Greek fable. The difference is Jesus puts a twist on it because when that story, it would be like me giving a, a parable example and getting spiritual insight out of Hansel and Gretel. Uh, if I were to stand up in front of most congregations and I would, I would say, uh, I'm going to share with you the story of Hansel and Gretel, or I'm going to tell you the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Most people would understand what that's talking about. So when Jesus is being questioned one day, he gives this picture and he says, there was a rich man and there was a poor man. Well, every Jew standing there knew the story and they knew exactly what he was talking about. The difference is, is when the story was normally told, it was the rich man that had a name and not the poor man. And he says, here's the rich man. Now, every Jew would have said, that's us. We're the rich man. He's clothed in purple. We're God's covenant chosen promised people. And he said, but then there was a poor man by the name of Lazarus. Now, this is where we've missed it for years in interpretation. Lazarus is, is the English of the Greek word. But Jesus wasn't speaking Greek. He was speaking Aramaic. And when you take the word Lazarus and you go back to the Aramaic, it's actually translated Eleazar. Now, every Jew standing there, especially Pharisees, when they heard the name Eleazar, their ears would have perked up because Eleazar was the servant of Father Abraham. And if you remember the story of Father Abraham, he's crying out to, 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 to Elohim, to Yahweh one day. And he says, I have no son, I have no heir in order to give my inheritance to. I only have this servant that's not a part of the covenant, this Gentile, if you may, Eleazar. So he was going to have to leave everything he had to Eleazar. So Jesus says both of these men, the rich man walked by Eleazar day after day, and they both died and they were carried into Sheol or carried into Hades or carried into the grave. And he says that the rich man was over here and the poor man Lazarus or the one that wasn't a part of the covenant was in Abraham's bosom they got so angry they tried to stone Jesus the reason they wanted to stone Jesus was not because of compartments in hell because again you don't build doctrine on parables parables are a story explaining a bigger picture they got mad because he said the Gentile the one that's not a part of the covenant is in Abraham's bosom and you're not OK, so it, when you understand some of these parables, man, there's meaning behind them that's so much richer a lot of times than uh, than what we've been taught. Luke 13, 6, it talks about the barren fig tree, the parable of the mustard seed, uh, the parable of the woman who took and hid three measures, picture the Trinity and the, the Afikamen uh, in the feast, uh, the great supper. Uh, he said, you know, uh, he came at supper time, not breakfast or lunch. But, you know, God wants to wants to feast with us on the third feast. He's like, I don't want you to just stay stuck at Passover or Pentecost, get into the Feast of Tabernacles so we can grow in, in the life of the fruit. The parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal. Uh, actually, Luke 15 is not three parables. Jesus actually says, this parable I speak unto you. Uh, Luke 15 is one parable in three dimensions. Uh, literally, uh, it, it shows all of us in that outer court as lost sheep. Jesus comes to get us. Then the one who lost the, the, the ring, uh, that's, the, that's a picture of the inner court. That's, that's the adolescent stage. And then ultimately, you see the story of the prodigal, which is more about the father than it is the son, because then we grow into the fatherhood stage and we grow into maturity. But it's one parable in three dimensions uh, in meanings. Uh, the parable of the dragnet, the great harvest, unjust steward, was afraid of his master, the parable of the wheat and the tares. And he said, if we're going to bring change into the earth, he said, I want you to, I want you to take the wheat. And he said, the wheat are the sons of the kingdom that get sown into the earth. What transforms the earth is when the sons of the kingdom are sown into it to bring transformation. Uh, that was parables. And of course, there's so many more. I encourage you to go back and study the parables and start looking at them through the lens of the audience Jesus was talking to. I believe there's a lot of light and life and revelation that will come to you because you're going to begin to realize that, man, he's here trying to let all of these Jews know that the gospel and this new covenant is not just for Jews, but for all of you. 
And that was the thing that normally angered them so much. That's why he said the kingdom of God is like a man who threw a great party and he bid all who were invited to come. Well, that was the Jews. They obviously had the covenant. They were the first ones invited to the party, but they started to give excuse. And it says, that then the husbandman or the head of the party gets upset and he sends a servant out to the highways and byways and invite all the people that maybe originally were not invited to come into the party. All of that is still one example after the other of what Jesus was talking about with old and new covenant and now including all those who were excluded. Now, the next one is emblems. Emblems are a figurative representation of another thing. An example is a scepter. Hebrews 1, 8, it says an emblem of sovereign power is the scepter of the kingdom, which is righteousness. Uh, Esther, when she came before the king, uh, after she fasted for three days, she wasn't invited by the king, which even though he, she was his wife, she did not, uh, normally not supposed to come into the presence of the king without being bid to come. And she went boldly in and he held out. Uh, his scepter. That means that he received her. It was a scepter of righteousness. First Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 uh, is talking about the Lord's Supper. It's talking about the bread and the wine, and they are emblems of his body and his blood. And if you remember back in Genesis, that Melchizedek brings uh, to uh, Abraham bread and wine, and then Abraham gives him a tithe of all of the booty from the war and everything that uh, that he just experienced and went through. Melchizedek, of course, being a picture of Christ who brings us his body and brings us his blood, all emblems of that. A uh, sword is an emblem of the word of God and the word in our mouth. Matter of fact, Hebrews 4 says that it, it is a two-edged sword, but the original Greek actually says a two-mouth sword. Uh, in Revelation, it says that when Jesus uh, uh, returns, that he's returning with a two-edged sword it's actually a two-mouth sword. I remember years ago when I studied that, I was like, Lord, what in the world is a two-mouth sword? And then it dawned on me because I always thought that the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, was the Scriptures. But actually, the Scriptures, the graphe, are the belt of truth, that we get truth alive and deep down in our bowels. But the sword of the Spirit, which is the only offensive weapon, is the rhema. It's the spoken Word of God. And Hebrews says the word of God is alive and quick and powerful, sharper than any two-mouth sword. So what's a two-mouth sword? When it comes out of God's mouth to us, it's one-mouthed. When God speaks to me or speaks to you, it's a revelation to us and it comes alive in us. But it's not a two-mouth sword till I take what God said to me and I agree with it and I let it out of my mouth. When I let it out of my mouth, it becomes a two-edged or a two-mouth sword. And that is the only thing that's actually called our, if you may, our offensive weapon uh, against wrong thought patterns and principalities and powers and everything else. And so uh, very important uh, to understand. Judges 7.18, uh, it, it talks of the sword of the Lord and Gideon. Uh, all of those different things are different emblems that meant also something else. Now, next are types, uh, types and shadows. Paul uh, Paul tells us through Colossians and Galatians that all that was beforehand, they were shadows of things to come. People through the Old Testament, they lived in the shadows and they were looking towards the light. We now on this side of the cross are living in the light and we look back in the shadows to find the light that was there. And so types are a prophetic representation of one thing prefiguring another and is a figure of that which is to come. Uh, the tabernacle of Moses, Exodus 26, it's a type of Christ and us, now the body of Christ. Know ye not, know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It has three dimensions, an outer court, an inner court, a holy of holies. We are spirit, soul, and body. It's shaped uh, like a cross when uh, when Israel would actually build the put the tent of meeting and they put the temple down and they put all the alignments of all of Israel around it. If you were up on a mountain, you'd look down and you'd see a cross, which is what Balaam saw when Balaam is hired to curse Israel and he's up on a hill and he looks down and he sees a cross and he says, how can I curse what God has blessed? Uh, all of that are wonderful types and shadows. The tabernacle of Moses uh, I've heard it said for years, it's the grandfather clause of most revelation. Our redemption is found in there. Uh, I love Dr. Kelly Varner. 
Uh, he did an amazing teaching years ago. I've had it for years. I look at it every once in a while. It's called The Tabernacle is Jesus. Uh, literally every piece of the tabernacle screams Jesus. It's full of types and shadows and wonderful things. Again, Melchizedek in Genesis 14 was a type of Christ. Joshua in Deuteronomy 34 crosses the Jordan to the promised land on the third day. Of course, we are, we are Joshua's promised land. Joshua, a picture of Yeshua or Jesus. And he comes into us because he said, ask of me. Father says, ask of me. I'll give you the heathen or the nations as your inheritance. So we are his inheritance. He comes into us, the promised land. And how he comes into us is some priests put their feet in the river Jordan and the waters, or there was a breach. There was something that was in between. And it says that the river Jordan rolled all the way back to a city called Adam. And Jesus is the one that rolls back all the mess that went all the way from Adam. And then he comes into us, the promised land, and he circumcises our heart. And he's the one that changes us and transforms us. And then he begins to deal with every king and every nation in the realm of our soul. He deals with every imagination, every condemnation, every denomination, all the nations, rulers, and squatters that were in our whole family line and family tree between our ears. And he gets to a place where he is laboring to enter rest in us. And Joshua, after defeating all those nations and kings, he's at a place of rest. That's why we're to labor to enter rest. We allow, we taste and see that he is good. And according to the book of Revelation, that he's sweet in our mouth, but bitter in our belly. Man, we taste of him and he's good. But when he gets down inside of us and he starts working on all those nations and kings and squatters that have been ruling between our ears for a lot of years, he begins to drive them out. Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. He begins to change us and transform us. And we, as we work out our salvation, uh, which is well, that's why we don't work it in. We don't work for it. We work it out. We let what's in us begin to flow freely out of us. Joseph is a beautiful type of Christ. Uh, he was given three coats, the coat of a prophet, a priest, and a king. The father gave him the prophet and the dreamer's coat. Then in Egypt, he receives a priest's coat because it was Potiphar that was a priest, and he gives him authority of his household, and he runs, and then he's given the king's coat when he's given kingly authority by Pharaoh. Uh, Aaron uh, also a picture of Christ when it says the high priest and his four sons, which is a picture also of fivefold, fivefold ministry. That's why the Ark of the Covenant was to be on the shoulders of four priests with a high priest out front leading them, a picture of fivefold ministry. Aaron preparing the temple for the priesthood was a type of Christ saying, I go to prepare a place for you. Aaron went in and prepared uh, the tabernacle and the place by sprinkling it with blood so that the priesthood had access. Jesus did the same thing when he said, in my father's house are many rooms. His father's house has three rooms. He's not building you a house. Uh, it's all about daddy's house. And we are tabernacles in father's house. And it's a three room house. And he said, if it were not so, I would have told you so for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive it in myself that where I am there, you may be also that already happened. Uh, Jesus did that he went and took his blood into the heaven in the heavenlies and what was a shadow on the earth was the reality in the heavenlies he pours his blood on the mercy seat and he prepares the tabernacle in heaven so now all of us the priesthood have access to that place because he prepared the place jesus was using high priestly language there abraham and isaac a picture of jesus and the heavenly father in genesis 22 David defeating Goliath and taking over for Saul was a picture of Adam, who was man's idea, head and shoulders above everyone else, and David being God's choice. David was also anointed three times, first time at his father's house, second time he was anointed um, at Hebron in Judah, and then Jerusalem as king over all of Israel. Jesus was also anointed three separate times. When you actually read in the Gospels, uh, a lot of times we think every time a woman came in and anointed him and poured oil over him, that it was one instance being told three different ways. But when you go back and study it, it was actually three separate times because they were done on completely different days of the week and completely different cities. And Jesus was anointed three times. I, I don't think it's an accident that his head was only anointed once, but his body got a double portion because we need twice as much as him. All right. You know, he, he's the head. We are the body. And all of that is, is a beautiful picture of, of David being a type of Christ. David came to Ziglag, where he had lost everything. His two wives had been taken from him. Uh, his children had been stolen from him. 
and uh, he cries out, he cries out uh, to God, and he said, what shall I do? And he goes to the high priest, Abiathar, which means father of honor, and he said, what shall I do? He said, in three days, you shall pursue this troop, and without fail, you will recover all. We know that Jesus did that exact thing on the third day, and Ziglag actually means the place of winding or turning or twisting. I like to call Ziglag the turning point, and it was at that moment that the scripture says that he he uh, literally encouraged himself in the Lord. That word encourage is the Hebrew word shazak. And it literally means to encourage. It means also to conquer. It means to make oneself. So he didn't, he didn't just, you know, go in the mirror and have a positive confession fit. You know, he just didn't say you're a winner. You got it. You can do this. David literally conquered himself at that moment because he was all by himself. Even his mighty men spoke of stoning him and Jesus while hanging on the cross, there was no one there to encourage him. Jesus in the grave had to do the exact same thing. He conquered himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, which I believe was Jesus's real death. His real death was Gethsemane, because when it says, not my will, but your will be done, it literally says that he laid down his soul. So he died before he died. His, his physical death wasn't a problem. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. His real death and struggle was when he had to lay down his soul in the garden. Jesus did this exact same thing. And in three days, uh, he, he recovered all. Uh, David also brought the ark uh, to uh, a new covenant temple with no veil. It was called the Tabernacle of David. And, and that very, very same thing then. Uh, took place with Christ, because now we who were prepared beforehand, according to Romans 9, we are that tent of glory, and David had a tent that had no veil with 24-hour praise and worship, where the presence of God didn't come in and out, but but habitated on a regular basis, and according to Acts 15, uh, that's where James gets up, and when he hears about the Holy Spirit being poured out on the Gentiles, he said, I perceive that this is a fulfillment of what the prophet said about the tabernacle of David. Also, again, a type of Christ. Uh, Joni, Jonah in the belly of the fish, a type of Jesus being in the earth for three days and three nights, uh, and then spit up into the ground to bring redemption and reconciliation. Eliezer, a type of the Holy Spirit, bringing gifts to Rebecca and telling her all about the Son of the Father. The Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. Esau, a type of the flesh and the first man, the brazen serpent in the wilderness, a type of Christ being lifted up in the wilderness. Jacob, a type of the heavenly Father. When Jacob is thinking that he had lost his son Joseph forever, when he discovers that Joseph is alive, Joseph brings his family uh, into Egypt and sets them up in their own area, in their own land. And then Joseph one day brings his two sons. Uh, he brings his son, uh, 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 I'm trying to remember the name there. I, I just lost their name. Uh, anybody shout that out to me? Uh, Ephraim, e thank you. Uh, it's Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh is the oldest son. Manasseh means made to be forgotten. Ephraim is the youngest son. Ephraim means doubly fruitful. And Joseph does the right thing. He brings him to the father and he puts Manasseh, the oldest son, at the father's right hand. And he puts the youngest son, Ephraim, at the father's left hand. But then when the father goes to speak a blessing over him, he crosses his arms. And immediately Joseph sees it and says, no, no, dad, you're doing it wrong. The right hand of blessing goes on the, the oldest one and the left hand goes on the youngest one. And the old man now, now, uh, now being Israel, he said, I know what I've done because the younger is going to be greater than the older. And in this picture, I believe Israel or Jacob is a type of the heavenly father because the heavenly father had begotten two sons on the planet. The first son, Adam, was Manasseh, made to be forgotten. And the, and the, and the first begotten, true begotten son of the father was now Christ. And Jesus was Ephraim, which means doubly fruitful. And at the cross, the father took the left hand of judgment and put it on Manasseh or Adam and said, you're going to be forgotten. And he puts the right hand of blessing on Ephraim and Jesus and says, because of the cross and the finished work, that the, the younger one is going to be greater than that other one. Now, we know in the, in, in, in the spirit, Jesus was way before there, there, there ever was an Adam and everything else. But there's a beautiful type and beautiful picture. Uh, in the midst of all of that. Elijah and Elisha, a type of Jesus and John, double portion of resurrection power. Uh, so many types through scripture 
that literally will just cause the scriptures to come alive in you. Uh, the next one, and, and, and we're winding this down, is symbols. Symbols are a representation of one thing standing for another. And I apologize, I'm going quick. I'm trying to get all this in in this amount of time. Uh, the cross is a symbol of suffering and death. It was placed on a hill uh, called Calvary or Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. In other words, uh, where the cross needs to be is between our ears and needs to be driven into our skull because our skull is where the problem are. It's always in our thought life that needs to be changed and transformed. Hand in scripture is a symbol of God's power as well as fivefold ministry. Uh, it's why when Jesus prayed for a man, it said he had a withered hand, not a withered arm, but a withered hand. Uh, and there's never been anything wrong with the arm of the Lord. Jesus is the arm. The arm of the Lord shall be revealed, but the hand was withered, and I believe that's a picture of fivefold ministry that we're not functioning, and their hand was withered because with the law, they beat the saints, and Jesus heals the hand and says, stretch it out. In other words, stop making a fist. I want you to stop beating the saints, and I want you to start blessing the saints, all right? The purpose for the hands is hands of blessing and not, and not hands to beat. Uh, Jesus said to Thomas one day, he said, I want you to take your finger and I want you to put it in my hand. Uh, fingers, uh, not only a picture of fivefold ministry, but also our fingers and our hands are a picture of our works and our labor. Uh, whatever you put your hand to. He said, I want you to take your work and I want you to submit it to my hand, to my finished work. Then he says, I want you to take your whole hand, not your finger, and put it in my side because I want to show you now uh, I want to show you the work that I've called you to that I predetermined before the foundation of the world. It can only be found in you placing yourself in my body because I have a purpose for you in my body uh, to bring life and transformation. A dove uh, through scripture was a type of the Holy Spirit, the gentleness of the Holy Spirit, but also Second Kings 25, it says that the people, when they were surrounded by an enemy, to make it lived on dove's dung and i've always said and first of all not only is that a nasty picture but what's dove's dung it's what's left when the dove flies away and it's sad to say but there's whole denominations today and whole movements that are living on what the holy spirit used to say what the holy spirit used to do they're living on dove's dung and they don't even realize it because their sustenance is not coming from the freshness of the dove being there but actually what's left when the dove flies away um fire and and power, fire, picture of power, purification, baptism, uh, God's life, uh, God's empowerment, but also God's judgment. First Kings 18, 22 through 25, Elijah on Mount Carmel, God answers by fire and consumes the altar. In Luke 22, Peter is warming himself by the fire. Paul shakes a snake off into the fire. Jesus said, you'll, be, uh, you'll receive a baptism of fire, uh, fig leaves are a, a, a picture and a symbol of self-righteousness. Jesus speaking to the fig tree and figs is what Adam and Eve covered themselves with. They covered themselves in their own self-righteousness. A uh, field in scripture is a symbol of the world. Jesus said the field is the world. The fields are white unto harvest. Bread, bread in scripture is a symbol of the word of God, Christ and his body because we are called one bread. I don't think it's an accident uh, that we're called called one bread. Notice Jesus didn't, uh, uh, Paul did not call us one yeast. He didn't call us one flour. He didn't call us one sugar. He said we're one bread because what's bread? It's a mixture of several things all put together. And it's a picture of the cooperation of the whole body of Christ. That's why one bread is full of life. That's why, that's why when we take communion as a local body, he said, I want you to take and I want you to break a piece of bread. Uh, like me, I personally, I know because of COVID, a lot of people uh, did this more. I don't like the little wafers. Uh, I don't like the little crackers because they're all the same. Every time you break a piece of bread off from a loaf, each, lo each piece is completely unique because none of us were made to be little, little, little crackers. None of us were made to be little wafers that all look the same. That's why we're never called living bread. Bricks were called living stones. Bricks are man-made. And there's something about each piece of bread. And when we gather together in communion, celebrating the goodness of God, each piece of bread comes together to make up the whole piece of bread. 
And that's why I believe it's so important that we still gather together so we can taste and see not only is the Lord good, but we're also called bread and we all have something to add to the body. And, and, and there is a tasting of the goodness of God that's also in each of us. Uh, that's extremely important. Jesus, of course, is not born just anywhere. He's born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. So the bread was born in a house of bread. Oil is a symbol of illumination and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Ten virgins, uh, there were ten virgins. Five of them had oil or illumination. Five did not. In Second Kings chapter 4, God gives instruction to uh, a prophet's wife who'd lost her husband uh, through the prophet Elisha. And he said, what do you have in the house? She said, the creditors come to take my, my two sons as bond, as bond servants and bondmen. And she said, all I have in the house is an anointing of oil. And he gave her these instructions. He said, I want you to go find empty vessels, not a few. Find as many empty vessels as you can. Take the oil you already have and start pouring that oil into empty vessels. In other words, stop praying for fresh oil. If you want fresh oil, find some empty vessels and start pouring the oil you have into empty vessels and you'll have fresh oil. I, I fear that sometimes in the body of Christ, all we do is get together and we just uh, we give each other oil changes. We just swap oil with people who already have oil and we never find empty vessels to pour the oil into. And that is that is when the oil never stopped flowing. And so that's a beautiful picture of releasing the life of the Holy Spirit that is also on the inside of us. Wind is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Genesis 2, it says that God walked with Adam in the wind or the cool of the day. That's literally the Hebrew word ruach or the spirit of the day. On the day of Pentecost, there came a sound as a mighty rushing violent wind. Uh, Babylon is a symbol of apostasy and sin's confusion. Revelation 17, 5 speaks of the harlot of Babylon. The Tower of Babel was a place of confusion. Languages were confused to create the nations. But on Pentecost, God uh, again sent a new language to reach the nations. Babel always dealing with confusion. In the book of Revelation, when it says come out and be separate, it's not talking about coming out of the world. It's about coming out of Babylon, which is a picture of religion to the nth degree in all of its confusion. A bow. A bow is a symbol of covenant. God put a bow in the clouds with Noah. Revelation says God has a bow in his hand. It's a picture of the rainbow or a covenant. Beard is a symbol of strength, honor, and maturity. Psalm 133, the anointing flows down the beard. Uh, that is why even uh, with Jesus, they were plucking his beard, a part of his authority. If with uh, Samson, they cut his hair and they cut his beard. There was an anointing and life that went through that. Corn is a symbol of harvest, increase, and blessing. Do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the corn. Oxen is a picture of labor, servanthood, and law. In Matthew 21, 12 through 13, Jesus is overturning the tables in the, in the outer court of the temple to those who sold oxen. Because he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, you muzzle the ox, speaking of ministry gifts. Shoulders is a, is a symbol of strength supporting government. For he said, uh, the government will be placed on his shoulders. Shoulders are part of the body. We are anointed in the body of Christ to carry the government of God into the earth. And of his government in peace, there will be no end. Uh, priests would carry the ark on their shoulders. Jesus is the head. We are the body. And we are called to be carriers of his presence in his life. Uh, the Holy of Holies, the East, a symbol of sun rising, God's glory. Sheep, a symbol of believers. Literally, there's one symbol after another all through scripture. And each of them have such wonderful uh, things to understand. And for us to fully comprehend how to properly interpret scripture, again, we look at those things and what do we do? First of all, we look at the historical context, we look at the language, uh, we look at what it meant to the original hearer, and then we do the, the joy of peeling the onion and getting fresh life, light and revelation out of it in and to and through us the day in which you live. I'd also really encourage you, one of the books that I encourage you to get at the beginning of this series uh, was Kevin Connor's books on types, symbols, shadows, and numbers. Uh, I, I have a whole other teaching I do on the meaning of all the different numbers in scripture, and there's such wonderful, 
wonderful revelation on all, all the different numbers. Uh, you know, of course, one of my favorite uh, to teach on is, of course, the number three. It's not in the number of the Godhead, but in Proverbs 22, verse 20, uh, uh, the writer of Proverbs says this. He said, he said, speak, he said, speak. Uh, uh, he said, I speak to you in, uh, in excellent things to establish you in truth. So he said, if you're going to be established in truth, that you're going to be spoken to and understand it with excellent things. And that word excellent things actually in the Hebrew language is translated threefold things. So God was saying, anytime I'm going to speak to you and establish you in a truth, it's nearly always going to be in a three. And I've found so far in scripture, I think 400 and over 80 threes that are literally in order. He's above all, through all, in all. Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Uh, prayer is three-dimensional. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it is asking, seeking, knocking. The will of God is three-dimensional. Good, acceptable, and perfect. Uh, you know, uh, the called, the chosen, the faithful. Over and over and over and over and over again. There's there's so many threes. A royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation. Uh, you know, he's uh, the way, the truth, the life. Uh, I always tell I always tell young leaders. If you don't know what to preach, if you're really struggling, like on a Sunday and what, on, what, on, on what to preach on a Sunday, just go look for a three, because all of the threes sit on top of the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. All of the threes are childhood, adolescent, and maturity, and you'll be able to minister to every single person in your congregation, because you need to make your sermon simple enough that a child can understand it, exciting enough for the adolescent, because that's the Pentecostals. All you got to do is just have a little shout and a little jerk in there, and they'll be happy. And then you got to give some nuggets to fathers and some nuggets to the mature, but you'll be able to minister to all. If you're going to if you're gonna speak on the will of God, say that the will of God is good. Well, the first thing you teach a child is that God is good. But when they become a teenager, they start questioning what you were taught was good, and they now have to accept that the God's will is good for them, but then God wants to mature or perfect his will in us. Uh, it's the same thing with circumstances. If I got uh, diagnosed tomorrow with cancer, uh, I'd look at cancer and say, okay, God's will is still good towards me, regardless of what I'm experiencing. And the quicker I accept that his will is good towards me, the quicker he will perfect in me my process to my health and me receiving the healing that he already purchased for me by faith at the cross. And so all of these things are, are they're just full of so much life. And again, I apologize that I don't go real slow. I'm a little bit of a machine gun, but you guys will be able to go back and listen to these over and over again. I'm just telling you, I pray above everything else that if these last several weeks together did nothing else, that it put a desire in you to go be a good Berean. It put a desire in you to desire the scriptures again, to long to dig in for that pearl of great price and realize that we're never going to get bored with God or the the scriptures are never going to be boring to you if you're constantly allowing the Holy Spirit to speak that new life in and through you. So anyway, that, that ends it for this session. I want to say, Apostle, thank you again so much. All of you that listen, all those that will listen in the future, man, we love you guys. I'm actually at my parents. I don't know if you can tell, this is my, my dad has an office with about 5,000 books <laughs> down in his basement. They're all around and all around me. I'm here in this little cubby hole, uh, but uh, I've got to go up and have dinner with my parents. So I need to bow quickly. Uh, I only get to see him uh, uh, a couple weeks out of the year. So I want to do that, but thank you guys all. Love you and believe in you. Thanks again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Before you go, let us thank you. Uh, a heartfelt thank you on behalf of all of us. Uh, tonight was extraordinary. Uh, uh, this was like a whole e-course in 45 minutes, uh, <laughs> machine gun style, and uh, it'll take us weeks to recover. Somebody commented that their head was spinning. Somebody commented this, the scripture is now inexhaustible. I mean, it is uh, this has been really, really extraordinary. And I want to, before we, before you go, I want to encourage our folks uh, that we will, would like to receive an offering for a speaker. Uh, I sent you information. You can send it to our PayPal information, or you can send it to, for those of us in Trinidad, to our local bank accounts. Uh, and so uh, we also invite you to check out um, Bishop Jamie's website. 
I think he posted it in the chat. And also check out the e-courses. You will, you will benefit enormously by doing these e-courses. Tonight, we talked about metaphors, simile, parables, emblems, types, and shadows and symbols. Oh, my word. Uh, this, this has been really, really tremendous. We talked about grasshoppers and talked about that metaphor. And the, the, uh, the grasshopper mentality, the grasshopper has a lot of eyes, uh, but he has no ears. So he, he cannot hear. And we know faith comes by hearing. And we have always looked at the scripture where John came eating locusts, wild honey. He was eating with a bug eater. He ate, he ate, and he came with grace. And he ate that which the children of Israel were afraid of. You know, we also note that uh, when they came, when Jesus was talking about a rich man and Lazarus, one of the issues there, and, and this is unknown to many of us, is that the reason the Jews were upset is because he was talking about Eliezer, he was talking about Lazarus, who was a Gentile. The issue is bigger than, than the, the, the compartments of hell or how large hell is or how hot hell. Jesus was talking about a covenant that incorporates the Gentile. You know, this was an entirely different spin on the parables. Uh, we talked about frogs uh, as a type of, the, of evil spirits. The two-edged sword, I love this. Uh, that which is spoken by God and that which is spoken by us. That releases power. Then the, That's when it becomes a two-edged sword in the earth. Not just what God has said, but what we say in response. The tabernacle, the grandfather clause of all Old Testament truth. And we, we are hoping that one, that soon we'll be able to get into that, that uh, branch of study, studying the tabernacle in some detail. One bread, several components, several ingredients in one bread. Jesus, born in the house of bread. Oh, my word. And Jesus, I tell you, we need to, that's why we need corporate ministry. We need to come into a house of bread, amen, so that we may experience the very life of God in that house of bread. Uh, this has really been extraordinary. Again, we want to thank Bishop uh, Jamie Inglehart for sharing this word with us. It has really been, uh, uh, you know, it has really been powerful. And we know he's got to go shortly. And, uh, and if you've got to go, but, uh, we, we would miss you. But we want to thank you again for joining us these last couple of weeks. Amen. God bless you, sir. God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Uh, Dustin, uh, I know you're on there somewhere. I'm going to ask you to come in and just chime in uh, on this on this matter. Uh, talk to us about what you heard tonight. Yeah, well, uh, heard a lot. You know, as, as Bishop Jamie said, he preached like a like a machine gun, and uh, yeah. but but it was good. Uh, I've read a number of the books that Bishop mentioned, mentioned, and I'm sure I think a few people here have read Kelly Varner's work on yeah. the tabernacle, but. Uh, always when you talk about the threes and the sevens and numerology in scripture, it always stands out to me, especially uh, the threes, you know, yes. what the outer court, the inner court, the most holy place, childhood, adolescence and mature sonship. And yes. I think it's interesting, you know, that three is the number of resurrection and it's also the number of maturity. Mm -hmm. So there's something you can take away from that, that uh, resurrection life and resurrection power is not an event as opposed to something you grow into, Amen. you know, because, you know, we talk about walking into the, in the life of Jesus, but it's something, it's not an event, it's something you grow into. So that sort of stood out uh, to me as he was talking tonight. Yes, excellent, excellent. Uh, this has been extraordinary. This has been an extraordinary couple of weeks, Dustin. And um, I'm so glad we brought Jamie on to share uh, this dimension with us, it has opened up the scripture to many, many people to really understand the language, the the the, the, the simile, the metaphor, the uh, the metaphorical language of the scripture that many times we have taken literally. One of the things he mentioned is that we don't take a parable and make a doctrine out of it, and that's yeah. what we've done with the rich man and Lazarus. We made a doctrine of hell, you know. And in fact, I've heard at one time that that uh, one preacher said that the that the rich man is still at this moment, still looking up and crying 
for Lazarus to touch his tongue with some water. Uh, and, uh, that, that's the, uh, the thing that's taking place. And so really, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to introduce to you a different a Bible. Uh, perhaps you, you've never seen the Bible in this light. It's going to bring life and light to you. It's going to explain who God really is. He's a good God. He's not out to punish people. He's not out to send everybody to hell, you know. But this was this was really, really um, extraordinary. Uh, Pastor Albert, give me your thoughts before I bring on someone else. Well, to me, the revelation and uh, knowledge flowing was like a Gatling gun. Uh, yes, and uh, mind-blowing. And Bishop Jamie certainly takes crayons and he colors outside the box, which uh, yeah. I love thoroughly. But what was resonating through my spirit uh, during the entire session was this, uh, again, it connects to Pastor Dustin about the tri-dimensional aspect, the numerology of three. And so right now resonating through my spirit, man, is what was and what is and what shall be. And it speaks to me of revelation and it talks to us about what has happened in terms of scriptures, what is progressively happening right now, but also what will occur uh, in the future. So for me, the scriptures are inexhaustible and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's so rich and so deep. You'll never get to the depths of, of the revelation, its impact on your life. And so revelation also is progressive. Some people have the mentality, I've read the scriptures, and that's the end of it. But I mean, the scriptures now have to read you uh, through the Holy Spirit and bring you to a new place. And so what was, uh, is in the past in our terms of our journey of faith, what is, is what's happening now. And so I'm right here tonight, excited, jumping really out of my body in the sense of the revelation that's flowing, it's transformational. And uh, but I'm looking forward as well to the third phase I dimension, because was is shall be can apply to our journey, to our faith, to revelation uh, and, and to to grace. And, and uh, so now I'm just full of excitement, uh, uh, Apostle Calvin, about what shall be what what is forthcoming. And so I'm full of excitement and enthusiasm in terms of what does God have in store for us? with what's happening here now, because we just can't tonight be exposed to such a revelation and remain the same. So transformation is happening to us. And I'm excited about how it's going to unfold in the future in terms of us going out as a part of the Ecclesia to see the kingdom advance and see darkness retreat and see the gospel just influence the people around us through the influence that's happening in right now. So what was, has been radically transformed about uh, about hell and uh, and uh, the end times and it's occurring in the now moment living in the now moment but i'm full of anticipation and excitement as the rest of us are about what is uh, coming down the road and uh, i've heard pastor dustin say you know the atmosphere of expectation is the breeding ground for the miraculous and so yeah. I don't know about anyone else, but I am in a jumping off springboard place now for the uh, expectation that the bishop has stirred up within me in terms of a springboard into that beautiful future that God has in store for the ecclesia, the body. And we have a privilege to be a part of it. So tonight I feel honored and privileged to be a part of such a flow of fresh manna, kingdom manna. Uh, and uh, and I'm just I'm loving it, eating it up and just have such an appetite now for more and more and more of kingdom advancement. What a blessing. Amen. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, you, you just given me the cue to introduce our next block of study because we will be studying the Holy Spirit because we have been receiving a lot of truth, a lot of theological information uh, through the first two blocks of study. And we will be talking about the Holy Spirit. And we'll be talking about implementa implementation and working what we've heard into reality. You know, uh, we, we manifest what is in our spirit. We manifest yeah. what's in our mind. Man is a, 
it's uh, as we heard uh, from another uh, another Zoom meeting I was on. Man is a, is a, he's a world machine. He is he is called to create worlds, and we have seen world systems, whether they're democratic socialist uh, systems or even church systems, that were created out of the image of God that we know. And so we yeah. have world systems created out of the image of God we receive. When we get our image of God correct, we will create a kingdom. We will manifest a kingdom such as never been seen in the earth before. And that's what's going yeah. on here. And we, we, we thank God yeah. for all of us who are part of this call. Now, what we will do, my friends, as we journey into the next block of studies, we're going to be having some weeks of prayer. And our next Thursday night session is going to be a time of prayer. Our intention is to activate the saints. Our intention is to activate the saints and the gifts and the fruit of the spirit. Uh, yeah. we, we, we want to encourage everyone to hear the voice of the spirit, to know how to discern the voice of the spirit, to know how to operate in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I, I had a, a, a vision some time ago, and please bear with me, that I literally saw a wave hitting us. And this wave hitting us, when it hits us, uh, I saw myself falling to the ground. And uh, literally, um, uh, what happened is that it, this, this wave changed our consciousness. Enemies became friends. Uh, we, we, we moved to a place where we began to see people as God sees them. It was a wave of miracles. It was a wave Amen. of the of Amen. the understanding Amen. of the spirit. Yeah. It was a wave that turned the world around. We are in such a transition, my friends. And this understanding we receive is, is very, very important. Now, one of my friends from the island of Trinidad who will be uh, assisting us, who will be sharing with us uh, in, this, in these next couple of weeks is going to be our friend Matic Nichols. And uh, so we'll have two weeks or so of prayer, and then Matthew is going to come on and talk to us about some of these things the Lord has been talking to him about. So Matthew, take a few moments and talk to us, please. Sure. Thank, thank you, Kelvin. Um, it was really good, I must say, to receive from all the guys over the last couple of weeks. Um, I couldn't make all the, the uh, meetings, but I've been eating up the um, recordings. And it's been really, really good. And I just wanted to say that coming up, um, it's going to be a little bit different. Maybe a little, we've been a lot about theological and, and philosophical, but the next few sessions that I'm going to do are going to be a lot more practical, as much as we can do um, with such a group and really getting into how do we begin to, we've learned about who this Christ is and who this God is. Now, how do we begin to get yeah. to them practically better? How do we how do we generate intimacy with God? How do we walk in step with him? How do we become transformed and get rid of all those uh, things that Jamie said uh, that's in our head, all those uh, uh, principalities and Hivites and Jebusites and all those guys? Um, it, it, they are practical, real things that we have to do to move from where we are now to becoming mature saints in Christ. And so that's, that's going to be the focus in the weeks, weeks coming up. So... Looking forward to, to, to being with you all then. Amen. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next couple of weeks are going to be very, very powerful. Beloved, we do not want this to remain in the realm of theory. We want us to begin to walk this out in shoe leather. Amen. Uh, what does Christ in us really mean? How do we flow in the gifts of the spirit? And so we've been doing this too, even in our local church. As some of you know, we will be, in our, in our new building, the next five weeks or so, at the Police and Scouts building in Coover. And uh, it's, it's a building right next door to the Chamber of Commerce. And I want to encourage us to be present because one of the things that will be taking place in this building is prayer, prayer, intercession, uh, activation of the gifts of the Spirit. Already the Lord has begun to show himself strong in the area of divine healing and deliverance. We've seen some remarkable testimonies of divine healing taking place. I want to encourage you to open your heart. And so to our friends in Trinidad, we will be at the Police and Scouts building. It's just opposite the uh, Chamber of Commerce. We'll be there at 9 a.m. on Sunday. Plan to join us. Plan to join us. 
And so we want to thank all of you who have been with us over the weeks. And next week, Thursday, uh, it, we will be meeting. We may probably share a short word, but we are going into prayer. We, we are praying. And so if you got prayer requests, you got areas that you want us to pray into for you. Hallelujah. Takarabo second day. Some of you are prophets. Some of you are very prophetic. We want to release you. We want to release you to flow in the gifting of the spirit. Amen. And if I may right now, uh, Jenny, I see, I see a, 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 an abundance of light coming to you. God is going to make some things clear to you. I'm seeing an abundance of light walking into your room, into your life, and into your house. I see a season of fruitfulness and the operation of the gifts of the Spirit in a powerful, powerful way to you. I speak this word to you in the name of Jesus. And there are others who are called of God. The hand of, in fact, we are all called of God. We want to pray that you will encounter the Holy Spirit. We want to pray that you will engage the Holy Spirit. We want to pray that you will have an experience with the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. So right now, I ask you to lift your hands of me. Amen. Just unmute your mic. Just worship him. Thank him for what he has taught us, what he's sharing with us. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Thank we give you glory. You. we thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you thanks. We magnify your name. Unto you be glory. Unto you be honor. Unto you be praise. And dominion. And power. 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 I will live and not die. I will, I will live and not, not, not die. I will do the will of God. And I will do the will of God. God. In my generation. In my, my generation. generation. Clap your hands unto him. Give him praise yet tonight. We glorify you, Lord. We glorify you. We magnify you. We thank you. We worship you. Thank you, Lord. And we thank you for showing yourself strong on our behalf. If there are those who are sick tonight, we speak healing to them. We speak healing to your body. We destroy sickness and disease. And we say, be thou cast into the sea. Be thou removed. In Jesus' name. I rebuke sickness. I rebuke disease. I rebuke the spirit of death. Go from them now. Jesus. And I release divine health upon them. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come Amen. expecting a tremendous time in God's presence. The next couple of weeks are going to be exciting. Amen. The Lord bless you. We love you. Thank you for joining us from around the world. Uh, you come from those of you that have tuned in from England, the United States, uh, the Caribbean. I saw Anik from Guadeloupe a while ago here. God bless all of you, my dear friends. Have a tremendous night in Jesus.